Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Mater, and the host and producer of Creatively Speaking Film Series. And we are so thrilled to be here tonight to be part of the symposium that the Smithsonian National Museum for African American History and Culture has so amazingly put together. Uh, it's something we've been working on with them for the past year. And we're so thrilled that we're finally here bringing it to you. Um, this is actually our 25th anniversary year in 2021 for Creatively Speaking. And we have been doing the work that helps to change the cultural narrative of people of color for all of those years. So when Joanne asked us to work on this program with her, it was right up our alley. It's also a personal interest of mine. And in fact, since last year, I've started working in earnest on my own family's migration narrative in a documentary film. So it's everything is just meant to be, right? So tonight I'm so excited to bring you three of our four filmmakers. Unfortunately, Julie Dash is not gonna be able to be with us. She is on location working on a new series that we look forward to seeing very soon. And she sends her major regrets, but we have some other amazing young women to uh, be here with us tonight. Uh, so as African-Americans, we are all inherently part of a broader ethnically collective demographic based on the fluidity of, fluidity of our identity. And so our program tonight is really a lot about that. It talks about how we change and morph as African-Americans throughout the world, but we are all still connected very much by our blackness. So with that in mind, our first film tonight is Standing at the Scratch Line by Julie Dash, which offers a so lyrical, poetic uh, narrative introduction to our series. I don't wanna tell you too much about it. I just want you to experience it for yourselves. And then we're going to have No Traveler Returns by Ellie Fumbi. Ellie, thanks for joining us. Of course, thank you for having me. You're here with us. And Ellie's film gives us a snapshot into the lives of African immigrants living in America from her home country of Senegal. Next, we will have the Bengali by Kaveri Call. Hey, Kaveri. Hi, Michelle. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I'm so glad you're being with us as well, and you're offering us this sneak preview of your feature documentary that is soon to be released, which offers a rare glimpse into the reality of the global immigrant experience from a very rarely seen perspective. So I can't wait for our audience to see that. And then, of course, there's Cassandra Bromfield. Hey, Cassandra. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, into my life, I came across this film a while ago, and every opportunity I have to show it, I do, because it's it's such a wonderful, wonderful, sna another snapshot of an uh, African-American experience. And in addition to uh, Cassandra, the other uh, filmmakers are Grace Remington, Ivanka. I can never say her last name right. Help me, help me, Cassandra. Be <laughs> I'm not gonna do it. Oh goodness! Just I sounds like I'm coughing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I won't say her last name, but Ivanka knows who she is. And who am I leaving out? Oh my goodness! Sarah Keeling. Sarah, how could I forget Sarah? Thank you, Keeling, very much. So, so um, with that. We will go straight to our films. We'll see all four films back to back, and then we'll come back and have a wonderful Q&A with each of the filmmakers and with you, the audience. So enjoy. Wow, what can we say? Amazing work, right? Thank you so much to all of our filmmakers. I just love watching these over and over again. I never get tired of them. Um, so before we start our, our conversation, uh, I'd just like to give a little background on each of the filmmakers. And um, since uh, you saw the Julie Dash piece, the first one standing at the scratch line, we'll start with with a little bit about Julie. I mean, I could, I could talk about Julie for too many minutes. So I'm just gonna give a little snippet of her, her bio. Um, so almost 30 years ago now, we'll be celebrating the 30th anniversary of Daughters of the Dust actually next year. Uh, filmmaker Julie Dash broke through racial and gender boundaries with her Sundance award-winning film for best cinematography. Uh, 
Daughters of the Dust, and she became the first African American woman to have a wide theatrical commercial release of this now classic feature film. In 2004, the Library of Congress placed Daughters of the Dust in its national registry, declared it a national treasure by the Library of Congress. Dash is currently developing an upcoming biopic on Angela Davis for Lionsgate Films, as well as scheduled to direct the Mahalia Jackson story. She's currently a distinguished professor of art and visual culture at Spelman College. And as I said, she sends her most sincere regrets. She couldn't be here with us tonight, but she's now on location in Mississippi working on a series on women in the movement. So we look forward to that as well. And second, we had Ellie Foopy. Ellie's, Ellie's film was No Traveler Returns. Ellie Fumbi is an actor, writer, and director from Cameroon. She holds an MFA from Columbia University School of the Arts in Directing. Her films have screened at several international film festivals, as well as placed in the Student Academy Awards semifinals. And she was nominated for an African Movie Academy Award. She was invited to participate in the New York Film Festival's prestigious Artist Academy. She's a Tribeca Film Institute alum and a Film Independent Screenwriting Lab Fellow. She made her directorial debut on BET's Hip Hop Anthology Tales, and she was a finalist of the 2019-2020 Venice Biennale College Cinema with her first feature film, which was presented at the 77th Venice, which was presented at the 77th Venice International it Will Festival. be. <laughs> oh, now because it hasn't happened yet, right? Yes, it's, so. the, it's actually next year. It's this so year. So now it's season. next, yeah, so now it's this coming year. Great. Yes. And you're a new director, Directors Guild member. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> we need all of those we can get. And next we have Kaveri Kahl. Kaveri is an award-winning Indian American filmmaker whose documentaries challenge who we are and who tells the story. She's the founder of River Films and her works have been featured at Dock NYC, Telluride, London, Rotterdam, and Sydney festivals, just to name a few as well as in Japan, India, Burkina Faso, and Italy, at the Kennedy Center, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, the Metropolitan Museum, the Cleveland Museum, and the High Museum in Atlanta. Kaveri has directed prestigious Imagine Foundation Award nominee Cuban Canvas, a Margaret Mead Film Festival selection. And she has also appeared theatrically with One Hand Don't Clap, one of my favorites of Kaveri. Uh, first look at the National Latino Consortium presented on PBS and Wild at Art in the PBS TV Art to Art series produced by Asian Women United. Through an intimate lens, Kaveri crafts stories which boundlessly straddle different worlds. And this film was no exception to that. Thank you so much again, Kaveri, for joining us. And last but certainly not least, our Cassandra Bromfield. Growing up in the largest affordable housing cooperative in Brooklyn, Cassandra's world was artfully framed by her mother's Kodak 8 millimeter camera. Thank goodness it was. <laughs> Today, still living in the same place, Cassandra examines and edits her remarkable films that her mother and archived for her and has helped her to gain insight into the challenges her mother faced as a creative black woman and the importance of her vision. The passion project led to a film collaboration with Union Doc uh, members Ivanka, we are we with the Ivana, Sarah Keeling, and Grace Remington, and it was called Into My Life. Cassandra graduated from the City College of New York with a Bachelor's of Arts, went on to the FIT to study fashion design, and graduated cum laude with an associate degree in fashion design. Simultaneously working for herself, Cassandra also worked freelance for a number of years with Audrey Smaltz, which whom we all know, the amazing uh, designer, and her company, the Cassandra Bromfield Company, primarily began custom designing wedding gowns, special order dresses, and now focuses on vintage and culturally inspired ready to wear clothing for today's independent, fashionable women. If you haven't checked out Cassandra's site, you definitely need to. She has amazing, amazing design. So thank you all so much for joining us again. So uh, let's get the ball rolling here. I know the audience is is probably chomping at the bit with questions, but we got I gotta ask you a few myself first. Um, so could each of you just talk a little bit about the film um, and your your films and relationships to them and what it meant to you to produce this work? Who wants to start? 
Don't make me call on you I'll go first. With, my, with my teacher hat. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Ellie. <laughs> go ahead, Ellie. Um, I, you know, I just, I graduated from school and I was, there was a lot happening. Um, this was, it was in the fall of 2017 um, in New York City. There was a terror attack in the Lower East Side. And um, it was perpetrated by a, uh, an immigrant. And I remember listening to all of the, um, the news about him, about his life, and about his struggles adapting to, um, to life in America. And I was struck by how much I had in common with him. And I started sort of looking at my own immigration here and, you know, just thinking about how my family assimilated. Um, and then I, and then, you know, shockingly about two months later, Parkland happened. And so there was, there were all these conversations about um, the difference of how immigrants are, or how terrorism when it's perpetrated by people of color versus when it's perpetrated by you know white americans the there was this kind of um this big this distinction between how it was covered and how people were uh ingesting it here in the states and suddenly i really um what started off as me wanting to, to explore my migration and my family's migration to the states sort of developed into wanting to explore the mindset of someone who is going to commit this kind of crime. You know, obviously not having any idea what people um, that are thinking about doing these kinds of things are actually thinking. I, I wanted to take a more, um, I don't know, poetic approach to it. And I, and I couldn't help but think about Hamlet's soliloquy to be or not to be when he's, considering whether to kill his uncle. And I, I thought it would be a very interesting way to explore this topic and also to frame it in this more universal, um, in this more universal way um, with probably one of the most famous soliloquies in the world. Um, and I thought it might make it easier for people to have a conversation about um, this you know what it i don't know like what it means to be other and also how yeah how they're how you know about what um how can i say this about um just exploring some of the biases that exist in this country i guess is probably the best way to say it absolutely no it's it's it, what you did was magnificent in this very short period of time um to tell the story and definitely connect it in a much more universal way than we're accustomed to seeing it and i made the mistake of saying you were from senegal you're from cameroon but yes. your characters are from senegal correct they're from ivory coast actually <laughs> Cote close Cote enough, enough. <laughs> Cote i don't know I, I always like to make people from senegal because that's where my <laughs> african roots are that's where i found out that my african roots are from senegal so i like to make everybody from senegal Anyway, okay, but this beautiful piece, I just love it to death. Thank you. Love it to death. Thank you. And so who else wants to go next? I'll go next. The same question, Kaveri. Awesome. Thanks. First, let me say this is an amazing gathering, and it's an honor for me to be here today with you. My film, The Bengali, takes African-American writer Fatima Sheikh from New Orleans, her hometown, to India where her grandfather came from. He was one of the first Indians of the United States in the 1890s, before the Asian Exclusion Act stopped that flow of movement. Like many of his fellow Indians, he married an African-American woman. Fatima is the granddaughter of this cultural tangle. She travels to India with me in search of her grandfather's past. It's an unlikely quest as we travel to a part of India where no African-American or American has ever gone. It's a unique story about the long overlooked ties between our South Asian and African-American cultures. It makes these connections stronger and even more relevant. At the same time, you know, I think our story strikes a universal chord. 
No, it's it's. I, I, of course, another another connection for me is New Orleans, right? My family's from my father's family is from Donaldson, Louisiana, which is twenty minutes from New Orleans. So, this is also uh, when I first saw this one, I was like, "What? What? Wait a minute! Wait a minute! This is like an amazing story." So, I can't wait for the finished piece to Barry to come out. We can't wait. I can't wait for you to see it. <laughs> And Cassandra. Yes. Um, my experience at first when I we were uh, I was approached, it was initially going to be about Lindsay Park, the development. And I thought more people would respond to them to do this, this because I just thought people would get a kick out of being part of a documentary. Uh, but no one responded and I uh, I still had all these pictures and stuff, and I, I said, you know, hey, I have pictures. No, they said, well, we really want to make a film about you, and I was like, if you think that's going to be interesting, okay. And I told that story many times because I just feel like, really? But I I do feel honored that it has had the journey that it's had. I always thought that there was great value in my mother's images. And like I said in the film, everybody didn't always like her taking pictures, but um, I have recording of my uncle being sworn in as a judge. And in the 70s, he may have been one of the first black judges here. He wasn't the first, but there certainly weren't a lot of judges, black judges at that time. So the fact that she found it so important and imperative to have this recording I, it it just just remarkable that she had this kind of foresight and uh my cousin also told me is that she just i have to go down there to help her organize we were just a picture taking family we don't know why because it, it's not as if anybody was moving into the area of photography or filming none of that but they we just were connected to the imagery and lasting and those, those those parts of it. So I I found it exciting that this has taken a journey and I, and I hope it inspires other people to not not a, not because now we're in this digital age where every you got a camera everywhere. It's in your your phone it's just you don't not have a camera. But what I hope that it preserves is what people will look at in those images and the importance of talking to elders or, you know, young people and what they feel and think. Those things are very important. Absolutely. And I just love how you say in the piece that um, you're sewing the stories together. You're stitching together these lives that, you know, your mother knew needed to be seen. And her foresight, I just think was in, truly incredible that, um, that she, she was able to do that. So um, let's get a little deeper. Let's dig a little deeper now. Um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the program that, you know, we have this as, as Africans and all over the world, people of African descent, we are all over the world. Um, and, and we have this sort of ability to change who we are or to adapt to who we are, depending upon where we end up in the world. Um, I'd like each of you to talk a little bit about that in your work. So Ellie, like for you, you know, how how do you think the migration experience is a little different for Africans coming to the U.S. as opposed to those coming from other continents and countries? Is is that experience specific for Africans? Um, I'm not. You know, I think it's. I think every every everybody has their specific challenges depending on where they move to, what community they have around them. Um, I think that I, I don't know, I don't, in my opinion, I mean, I, I don't think that those challenges are necessarily, uh, a lot more different than say other, other people coming from other places. Um, I think that there's always the struggle to find, you know, to, to find, that comfort to to sort of rebuild that that community around you. I think that's probably true for 
all other, um, you know, other people come people coming from different cultures. Um, but I think, you know, as Africans, um, we tend to flock to where um, to where there already is an existing community. I know that when my family moved to New Rochelle in New York, there was already an existing Cameroonian community here. And I think that that probably informs, um, you know, how we settle into a place. Um, I, I can imagine that that's probably similar for other communities as well. Absolutely. Um, I thought it was also interesting that there seemed to be a common uh, theme throughout all the films, even a little bit in yours, Cassandra, of um, this idea that we, we find solace amongst ourselves and oftentimes that is through prayer, right? And even in Julie's film, of course, she was shooting in um, uh, the church in Charlottesville that, that had, was the site of that terrible massacre. Um, as well as in uh, Mother Bethel in, Phil in Philadelphia, which was the oldest black church in the country. So it's like this sort of thread that goes through all of our cultures, regardless of where we come from. Kaveri, I yeah. I just wanted to add another dimension. You're absolutely right in everything you're saying. In the case of my story, of course, African-Americans were rooted in their communities of like-minded peoples. They felt safe there, and we all know they needed to feel safe. But they welcomed the new arrivals from India who weren't accepted in white America. The Bengali is very much about the openness of African Americans to strangers who were so different in culture and lifestyle. And the marriages between the Indian men and the African American women were built on dreams of a shared future and their own tremendous capacity for change. That's the legacy of migration in our world today and the cultural blends that come out of it. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. I think that's sort of in another common thing through all of the all of the films. Um, yeah. I, I also love, Kaveri, how you talked about um, Fatima going into this this village in the Bengal that was, you know, almost like gentrification in reverse, mm -hmm. right? And how she recognized that herself. It's like, that's a very, what we think is a very American thing, but she actually recognized that. Absolutely. She was very aware of how she would be perceived in the village. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a collision of uh, perceptions, which one has to wade through when strangers meet. And you actually, Kaveri, your film actually does double duty in a way. And I'm, I'm anxious to hear how you, how you felt accomplished that because you're telling Fatima's story, but we also get a glimpse into your background and your narrative because you migrated here to the U.S. from the same place, right? Yeah. Is that what first attracted you to Fatima's story, sort of this reversal? Definitely, and double duty is a great way of putting it. <laughs> My late mother always told me there were Indians who came to America long before us. She was a history teacher, so she knew I'd never find anything about that in the books. So for many years, I poked around trying to learn more. And then to meet Fatima and her family, what more could I ask for? It was just wonderful to be able to travel with her back to Bengal, where I'm from, and to make a film that takes viewers across the same geographic, cultural, and spiritual boundaries. And then to come back as an American to tell a story that brings our different communities together. Really, what more can a filmmaker ask for? Absolutely. I, I just have to talk to you once I get a little more into the weeds with my film, how you did that, how you managed to do that. I'd love to <laughs> know that. I'd love to. And actually, Cassandra, that brings me to my question for you because you know, you how did you balance? This was actually my one of my uh, students asked this question, and I was going to ask a similar one, but she's asked, "How did you balance your professional and personal life while in the middle of making this documentary about you and your family and your mom, and and to see it finally reproduced in this way?" Well, it wasn't. Um, too much, it wasn't too much hard work, like, uh, 
considering that I, the other filmmakers, I didn't, I didn't dictate fades and and which clips to use. I allowed it to to flow. It's not even I allowed it to flow. I felt that as a collaborator, each person has to do the greatest thing that they can do for the film. So if I, you know, started dealing with somebody else's sound or music or something like that, it just it, it's it's too much. And everybody doesn't get to shine as a team player. I, I just felt they well here it is, you know. And they, then we interviewed and did various things, but it it just it just flowed. It wasn't any any issue of taking up my time here and there. It, it was it was boom. <laughs> it was just boom. But I did want to talk a, a minute, just a second, about immigration because my mother's family came from St. Vincent. My grandfather came here at with probably an eighth grade education, but he became a New York City police officer. Now, he had four children. All four of them went to college. One became a judge. One was an engineer, and the other was a New York school teacher. And my aunt, who, who did go to college, but she left, she was married to a colonel in the, in the United States Army. He didn't do bad for an immigrant. <laughs> and, you know, and, and I think that when I think about it, even his second wife, because his, his uh, first wife who died, who abhorred the children, his first wife died. Um, Mama, who was the grandmother I knew, one of my uncles uh, decided that he was going to join the army. She went up to the United States Army and said, not my son and not today. Do not take it. So, and she was from Virginia. So it, it's interesting the thread and the power that we have as uh, people who were born here, people who immigrated here. Our power is unending. You know, it's like, and I think there's a statement where they say they threw us in the dirt, but they didn't realize we were thieves. So, you know, we, we are so powerful within even the darkness. We are just so powerful. You know, I'm glad you said that, Cassandra, because I was thinking earlier, too, that the timing of when we were supposed to have first have this symposium and to now, it's like night and day. And I think we were supposed to wait till now because, you know, if you think about it, that was during, you know, the T word, I, I never say his name, the T word administration. And now we're in a new era with a lot more hope and, um, and people with some sense uh, leading our country. And so, and also with this, you know, this immigrant, you know, uh, person from our vice president. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And so now to have this, symposium taking place now is I think it's the timing was actually it's it was the way it's supposed to happen um and before I move on thank you for bringing in the migration story because I do want to talk a little bit about um Julie's film before we move on this documentary standing at the scratch line was commissioned by scribe video center in Philadelphia as part of their multimedia exhibition they did back in 2016 celebrating the 100th anniversary of the great migration and the project they commissioned five films five artworks about the connections between what black migrants left in the agricultural south and the newer capitalist industrial world that they founded and created pretty much here we did in the north and that julie you know took this opportunity to portray the stories of people seeking refuge and freedom in the african methodist episcopal denomination with the metaphor of the suitcase which i just i love um, and then she she worked with Mother Bethel AME Church in Philadelphia and Emmanuel Church in Charleston, which we know was the site of that terrible massacre just the year before. Um, and I just want to give this short quote from uh, Executive Director of Scribe Video Center, Louis Messiah, who's an film, amazing filmmaker in, on his own. And he said, uh, the Great Migration was a movement that transformed America and many parts of Philadelphia. Today, when we use the term urban, we often take it for granted, but there's a connotation with that word to the great migration when African-Americans moved into a city like Philadelphia and created institutions. And that's what we did. And I think that's what, 
you know, all of your films represent as well. You know that we have this history. We have this this base here in the United States as you know part of the the fabric of this of this country that people often seem to ignore it unless it's February. Unless it's February, which I'm, on, <laughs> which I'm now on a I'm now on a campaign to get you know Black History Month all year long because that one shortest month of the year is, is not working for me. Um, <laughs> but with that, I think we have a couple of questions from the audience. So let's see. Uh, yes, we have from audience member Krishna Lewis. So for Ellie. Um, and she asked, is the narration reflection of the young man's thought? Is it your reflections as the director or do they draw from Hamlet to tell a particular story? Well, you talked a little bit about that, but. Yeah, um, I think it's all three. It's all three. It's, 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 it is meant to be sort of an inner monologue that the character is having, but it's also my way of, of kind of framing the conversation around that and, and giving um, his inner struggle, uh, this, this more universal uh, framework, which I spoke about earlier. Um, so I think it's all of those things, really. Absolutely. And then uh, for Kaveri, what is the name of the village near Kolkata? The name of the village is Kori. It's in Hubli district. It's a remote village, not so easy to get to. But if you're planning to go there, say hello to everyone for me. I'm for Potomac. <laughs> and we do have, by speaking of that, we do have um, uh, information for everybody on the, on the uh, program today. We have how to reach out to all the filmmakers and where to find their work. So we're gonna provide you with that uh, before the program is over. Okay, and the next question is for Cassandra. Uh, this person said they love all films, all the films, and she's an Afro-Cuban American female doc filmmaker working on her family doc called Congri, a Cuban American love story. How difficult was it making the editing decisions on what stories to leave out? And that's from Sandy Waters Milford. You know, um, I can only speak to my little YouTube business that I do, but uh, what you begin to do is you tell the whole thing. You put all of the all of the stuff in it, and then you watch it back over and over again, and you take out what's unnecessary, and you just keep going. That's how I do it. That may have, other filmmakers may have other processes. But in, in this case, we, we had a lot of films to edit through. So it, 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 any of those clips could have been anything. They could have been any one of the clips. Uh, it just so happened that these are the ones that landed. I think that the top thing that did land was the recording of the birthday party at five years old. That recording is actually two hours long. <laughs> so <laughs> my mother had a... I don't know. She had an idea. Put the mic down and let the kids go. So that that you know what you do is just you put it all in and then you kind of edit down. You do it section by section. But you know, depending on the length of the documentary that you want to tell, if it's five minutes, you got a lot of work to do. But if it's a two-hour documentary. Um, that you can ease your way into what are the important and key points that you want your story, how you want your story told and what's important to the story and what, you know, what you should have in the story and what's not that big a deal. Right. How, how about you, Kaveri and Ellie, what are your, what are your techniques for how you, how you whittle something down? I mean, I think it's a little easier with a narrative when you have a, a script. Um, but it's a, in a maybe a different kind of process for you. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, yeah, it's your own, you're making the film three times. When you write it, it's it's one thing on the page, and then you shoot it. And some there are things that happen that surprise you um, that aren't necessarily in the script, and you decide to include it, um, or something that you've planned doesn't quite work out, or it's not working, uh, you know, on set. 
And so you you change it. And then when you get to the editing um, of the of the piece, it's 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 almost like you have to let go of of the script and everything else. All you have is the footage that's in front of you, and you have to you know carve that footage and make it the best it can be. And that sometimes means that you know scenes that you had planned or scenes that you shot, you decide that you're going to cut. I mean, in in No Traveler Returns, there were there, I think there was one or two scenes that I that I didn't end up including in the film because it it just didn't work as well um, uh, in the t totality of it. So yeah, it's a constant negotiation between you know what what you you know what what's in front of you you're you have to constantly focus on the footage and not so much your idea of the film well while we have you on on camera i want to ask you how did you shoot that Times square scene that was just <laughs> incredible i don't how did you manage to do that i mean that was like we, real footage right <laughs> yes yes we we got very lucky um the i Honestly, I didn't even, I, I was expecting to be stopped at, at, at any point, but it was Valentine's Day weekend and there were a lot of people there and the police were really chill. Um, we, and it was the perfect kind of environment for what we were building. You know, we had this character in a very somber mood and then there was all this happiness around him. Um, but yeah, it was, we, it was me and my DP. We had a fairly, you know, small camera. So we were trying not to be, you know, too obstructive. Um, and I think the key was really just keeping the crew tiny. It was literally me and my DP and my sound person. And that was it. It was the three of us working with the actor and that's how we got it done. That was incredible. I kept thinking, watching the whole time, I'm going, how did you do this? Um, <laughs> but Kaveri, tell us, tell us about your editing process how do you how did you and i'm sure that you know you had you're coming from a larger film coming to the smaller version here so that had to be hard well the smaller version you saw a, really is a compilation of scenes uh which may or may not be in the final film and may be in different positions but i was happy to share it with you um the the editing process for the final film meant working very, very closely with an editor whose sensibilities matched mine. And I find editing is a lot like sculpting. Now, I'm not a sculptress. I don't know how to sculpt. But I imagine myself sculpting when I'm editing because you start with a mass of, of material and you whittle down and you chisel away until you find its shape and it starts to breathe. And, of course, you go into a film film with an idea in mind because you know, I can't afford to shoot footage endlessly and nor do I want to. Um, but in the editing process, the story starts to take shape and it's very exciting. Keeps you up at night. Um, there are moments of great, you know, how will this ever come together? And there are moments of great, oh, we got it. So it's a wandering through the unknown. Uh -huh. you have to enjoy. That's, and enjoy. you have to. You have to enjoy it, right? Because <laughs> editing is the hardest part of the process, I think. I don't know. This is um, kind of like a confession. It's strange, but I enjoy it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So our last question from an audience member, I want to tie into my last question and and that is uh, to talk about um, uh, other black filmmakers that inspire you and What's your next project? Wow. Some of the black filmmakers that have inspired me because they stood out, you know, I grew up Indian American in a country where uh, Indian Americans were fairly invisible. So I reached out to the example and the inspiration of many black filmmakers, Zora Neale Hurston, shot some lovely films in her early career in a very adventurous way, going into communities where she knew she wasn't sure she'd come out, if, let alone come out with anything. But she was very inspirational. Uh, Gordon Parks did some beautifully lyrical, poetical films that I have always loved and still go back to watch. Mm -hmm. How about you, Ellie? 
Um, this is an easy one because it's literally inspired um, no traveler. It's a uh, Usman Semben, um, the Senegalese filmmaker. Um, his work really inspired me. Uh, I, I tend to, yeah, there are a lot of African filmmakers like Semben and um, Jibril Diop and um, even Yusan Palsi. Um, her film, A Dry White Season, is, I think, when I first saw it, really like revolutionized um, m my whole world. <laughs> um, and I think she was the first black woman that I, I really, uh, that, yeah, whose work just, um, whose work I saw on such a grand scale and, and uh, yeah, really inspired me to, to pursue filmmaking. And what's what? Are you have any plans to turn No Traveler into a feature, or what's your? Next I do project? not. Okay. I do not. But I'm working on it. So the the film that I'm that I'm that is uh, that will be at Venice. It's uh, called um, Our Father the Devil. It's a. Uh, it. I'm going to be shooting it in two months in the south of France. It's a thriller um, about an African immigrant living in the south of France in this small town. Um, whose life changes with the arrival of an African priest whom she recognizes from her past. And it, it, this man has, um, she has a, a it's, it's struggling with PTSD and with things that happened to her back in Africa. And the arrival of this person um, kind of triggers all of this back up again, so. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds amazing. I can't wait for that. And how about you, Cassandra? So it, it, the, the list is it's difficult because now I'm all of a sudden drawing a blank. But I will say when we, when we were asked to do this last year and Julie Dash was on the panel, I was, I, I was so, so excited. And because I had admired so much the imagery that came out of Ju Daughters of the Dust and what I remember about the Wonders of the Dust is how hungry we were for those beautiful images and that story being told. I mean, we waited online to see the, the film and how excited New York was. I don't know where else people were. We were so excited and we waited online. That, that, that was the beginning of, you know, all that whole Spike Lee stuff and people waiting online to see these small uh, films, but in her case, uh, we waited. Now you have to see Daughters of the Dust like two or three times because first you see it for the imagery, then you go back to see it for the story, and then you go back to put all of those things together. So you you have to. It it really um, just I just love the what she can do and what a person can do with imagery and how the, the, the story could be powerfully told with not a whole lot of stuff, you know, happening. And uh, it, it, was, it was so powerful the way when that, when that film came out. So I, I definitely admire Julie Dash. I'm sorry she's not here to hear this, this but I definitely- She will. I'll make sure she hears it. I'll make sure I she really hears it. And, and I just have to tell you a little side anecdotal story. I don't know if you know this or not, but I had something to do with those lines you had to stay, stand in for daughters. Just a little something. <laughs> <laughs> that was my company that worked on the distribution and marketing of the film. Wow. Yeah, that was with my with my business, my partners. Yeah, we worked on that. Was that's why I said we're celebrating thirty years uh, in twenty two, because that's when we yeah. brought it out. Was in nineteen ninety two at uh, the film forum. That was the yeah. line we stood in, right? <laughs> there. One of them was in Brooklyn. Oh, you were in Brooklyn. I, I, okay. Yeah, yeah. One of those small theaters were in Brooklyn where they were showing. They would show some of the. Um, like Sankofa was shown at this particular theater. I mean, there were a few theaters that were pretty good at showing these uh, small run um, distribution, small uh, independent films. But that time was so exciting. It was just, we needed that so much. You really did. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I, I know Julie will be thrilled to hear that you stood in one of those lines for her too. <laughs> Well, it looks like we are past actually our time to end, but I 
would love to have this conversation with all of you again. We could do this, I'm sure, for another hour if we had it. Um, but again, thank you so much for participating, for hanging in here with us for a whole year. It's been amazing. Um, you know, your work speaks for itself, and we look forward to to whatever is next for you. And because we know it's going to be great, we know it's going to be great. Um, so I just yes, thank you. <laughs> I just want to close out with uh, telling people in the audience to please let the museum know how much you enjoyed this program so that we can get more film programs like this. And to thank all of your att attendees for the whole symposium. Tomorrow is the last day. It's a session number nine, Act Advancing Blackness and Activism and Justice at 4.30 p.m. And it's the same link that you used to enter this session. And there's only two more sessions tomorrow, closing out the symposium. And if you haven't participated in something yet, it, you, you should try and get to those two. I'm going to be on there, I know. But thank you again so much. Thank you to the Smithsonian, Joanne and your staff, and Maya and Keith, everybody on this call. And it's been a pleasure and an honor to be with you women. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so from much. Julie as well. <laughs>